Hi there. My name is Carl Horn. I'm the founder and president of Cinetech. We specialize in manufacturing professional camera accessories for the film and video bro. Our product line include matte boxes, follow focus units, handheld supports, brackets, monitor mounts, and so on. This is our newest uh, follow focus system. It's the Titanium SL. It's uh, very strong and super lightweight. We use uh, aircraft aluminum, titanium components, and stainless steel parts. It's got some very unique features. One of it is the detachable scale blade. It's very easy to come off, easy to clean, acetone resistible. Another unique feature is uh, our clip stop. You can set the final focus stop and uh, this way you do not go past infinity and all your focus marks will return. We attach the LED light to the top of the scale knob. If you turn it on, it will light up the upper part of the scale blade. This gives you easy reading for your focal marks. Our adjustable swing arm easily swings out. You uh, swing it in, engage it into the lens gear, and clamp it. The unit comes with a flexible focus rod, which you can uh, mount into your follow focus. This allows you to pull focus from the opposite side. By snapping in the focus rod into the follow focus unit, If you want to pull focus from the back of the camera, you simply pop in the focus rod to the rear of the follow focus unit, and this way you can pull focus behind the operator or from your tripod handle. Simply pop it in. The hand grip attachment mounts to your tripod handle. The other end of the focus rod you connect to your hand grip attachment. And you are able to pull focus from your tripod handle. You're also able to put your, your focus rod uh, into the scale knob. This way you extend your, uh, your knob a little bit out and you're not too close to the camera or to the operator. The drive gear is driven by a belt which is adjustable and uh, because of the belt, uh, we eliminate any blade in the follow focus unit. The end of the swing arm, you can take the drive gear off, mount it from one side of the swing arm to the other side of the swing arm. Follow focus drive gears come in different sizes and in three different pitches. What you see here is we call the film pitch small size, medium size, or large size. This would be Canon, and this is Fujinon. This covers uh, any professional lens out in the industry. Focus rods come in different lengths. Standard size is six to seven inches. Next one up 10 inches. They go all the way up uh, to 36 inches, or all the way down to the short coupling here. This useful tool is called a speed crank. It easily pops into your focus knob and it will enable you to pull focus very quick, very fast, very accurate. Besides the plastic, the standard plastic uh, focus knobs, we also offer a variety of wood grains. 
as uh, maple wood, coca bola, teak, and others. This gives it a nice feel for the camera assistant to pull your accurate focus. So what you just saw in the demonstration is our standard 50 millimeter lightweight follow focus. Besides the lightweight follow focus, we also offer the 50 millimeter bridge plate follow focus system for full size uh, film or video cameras. And the 19 millimeter uh, rod follow focus system. This is our 50 millimeter bridge plate rod follow focus system. 19 millimeter bridge plate rod follow focus system. One new feature on our follow focuses is the snap on version. This way, you can put the follow focus on your support rods without removing the mat box. A new clamping mechanism locks the follow focus positive in place. This is the way you mount the follow focus to your support rods. Slide it on. Line up the drive gear with the lens gear. Lock your follow focus and engage your swing arm. Lock the swing arm. And you're ready to go. What you see here is the Cinetech four stage swing away mat box system. It holds two filters, horizontal, either 4x4 four four or 4x5.6. Four One filter stage is rotatable 360 degrees. In the back of the mat box, we have a bellow. The bellow pops out easily and holds another filter. Filter size is four and a half inch or 138 millimeter round. It's usually used as a polarizer. We remove the retaining ring. Take your filter, just pop it in. Put the retaining ring back on. Your filter is mounted in the bellow. The bellow pops into the back of the mat box. The front of the mat box has got a very wide shade. This allows you to use wide angle lenses without veneering. On the bottom of the mat box, a swing away hinge is mounted. This allows you to swing out the mat box if you have to change lenses without taking the mat box off. Easily swing it back and you're ready to go. This is how you mount your mat box. The swing away mechanism allows you to swing out the mat box without taking it off. It makes the changes of lenses very quick and very easy. You can rotate the bellow and individually you can rotate your filter stage for your grad filter. This is another useful attachment for the mat box. We call hard mats. You want to eliminate extra light, unwanted light hitting your lens or your filter trays. 
So easily, just pop on the hard mat in front of the, the shade, and the extra light is not able to hit your, your filters or your lenses. We offer two filter sizes, 4 by 5.6 or 4 by 4. One characteristic of soft light is it's not as easy to cut like hard light. You can put a, a cutter or some sort of block and you, know, you can cut it like a knife. With soft light, the issue is controlling. That's the, the terminology used, and that is to keep it from spreading everywhere because soft light does do that. It, it tends to spread and actually bend, uh, whereas hard light is more defined and, and rigid by nature. And so um, what we use is a louver to control that. The, Fixture housing is the uh, polycarbonate housing now, and it has reinforced ends, and it also has rivets in it so that you can actually put a nail through it without putting it through the fixture. This housing has uh, most recently been updated with a flex tubing. Uh, it actually has copper within the flex tubing. Uh, when it first was designed, it actually had just a copper wire, but we found it would kink out over time and wouldn't last as long as we had hoped it would. So now we have an actual silver conduit, which is a flex tubing, it allows you some rigidity of movement so you can tilt it back or open and it'll stay there. Also the reflector has holes in it which has small clips, which where your, is where your lamps clip into. And of course, the lamps being the most important component of this fixture, we have um, several color temperatures, uh, primarily though daylight 5500. That's why this uh, end cap is blue, so it easily identifies it as a daylight tube. This is the 2900 Kelvin lamp, indicated by the red ring. This is the 3200 Kelvin lamp, uh, also tungsten, indicated by the gold ring. These are to make it easily identifiable once it's in the fixture, especially when the fixture is off, so you don't have to pull any of the components off to see what light it is. You can just look through the louver or at the end of the fixture and see what color lamp it is. The last component of the fixture is the louver, and also a very important component in that it helps to control the light. Without a louver, the soft light will spill everywhere, top, bottom, left, and right. What the louver does is then bring that light in so it's not spilling all over the set where you might have a second camera, you might have some other uh, reflective instruments perhaps, or you just need the set dark in the background or, or sides. Attached to the harness is our four bank cable. Now we have different color cables for the different lamps, meaning we have a yellow for the four bank, we have a red for the double, and a green for the single. Not that it's necessary to memorize those, but this will be a four bank cable, and that of course couples directly to the four bank harness. The lamp harness has four individual cables, one to each lamp, and they're shortened to, to the length so that each one only goes to one lamp. This way you won't have any confusion of which one goes where. Uh, you can see there's a shorter one for the first, then it goes to yellow, and then black, and finally to blue. And each one is cut to length to match that particular lamp, so it makes it easier for you to figure out what order they go in. The harness is then attached to a four bank extension cable. It's always recommended when you disconnect to turn off the power source, so it's always important to turn your ballast off first. So I'll turn off the lights one at a time. And now I can disconnect the harness. It just has a coupling ring, very easy to unscrew. It's a 16 pin cable and it also has a keyway which makes it easier when you do reconnect so that it would then reconnect very simply. So now I'm going to show you the mounting system for the four foot four bank. This is an Omni mount and it's our newest design. It's what we call a universal mount. It's because the same mount is used for our single, double and four bank systems. Uh, and that would be up to the four foot size. We have different style for our larger fixtures, which I'll show you later. But you notice it has four capture points. It also has a pin. The idea is that it has much more uh, grabbing power when you put it on the fixture. And then lastly, it has a ball joint omni mount on the back, which allows you then to put the fixture in any orientation you wish, when it's on a stand or hung overhead. This particular stem, 3 8 inch stem, is designed to work on a grip head, so you can put it on a stand or C-stand. Uh, it's knurled, so it gives it a good grip on the stand end, and of course then you'll be able to manipulate its direction by just opening up the omni mount and then locking it down. 
Be careful though, you don't open this too far. It's actually spring loaded. If you open it too far, once it desprings, it's not easy to get back together. So just loosen it enough so you can get it loose to you know, correct the direction of your fixture and then lock it down tight. So this is the standard mount that comes with all of the four foot four banks. However, we do have a variation of other mounts and that is available by request. One of those mounts is the baby receiver. As you notice, it's got a uh, about a hundred degree angle on the arm, but it has a five eighths baby receiver on the end. Therefore, you can take a grip head off of a C-stand and mount it directly onto the top of the stand. Or one of the most important things would be to hang the fixture off of a Mafer or any other type of clamp that has a baby spud. This will then slide onto it and lock into place and give you a good solid grip for hanging the fixture overhead. You notice these have the same omni mount ball joint. So essentially you could actually use one mount and just take the ball out and switch to the other mount that you wish to use. And therefore you don't have to carry several mounts and you just tighten it back up. Or there's other shorter versions of the baby mount we have for straight down rigging. So always check and see what type of mount you need so you have the right thing for the application you're using it for. The early version of the four foot four bank had a mount that simply used plastic pins and it would just snap in by pushing the pins down. What we found over time is they would wear out and get loose and could risk the fixture falling. So this new universal mount was developed and as you can see it has the four grooved holes for your uh, locks to interface with and then it has a pin. You can just turn it to the right and snap it into place. It's very tight and sturdy. When you're ready to remove it, all you do is pull the plunger to remove it from the pin, turn it to the left, comes right off. One of the uh, small items that is attached to the mount plate, which is asked quite frequently, is what these small wire bands are for. And those are simply for safety chains. Even though the fixtures are fairly light, we still want to be safe on set. So always try to use a safety chain when rigging. As you can see, these are different variations of the four bank I've been talking about. And to show you the consistency of the system throughout our line of select systems, this is a two foot single fixture. And below that is a two foot double. As I said, it's describing its length and how many lamps it has. One of the things you'll notice right away is the color of the tubes. These are probably gonna appear a little more orange to you because these are tungsten balanced. However, if you white balance your camera to that source, it will look normal under regular circumstances. So what I can show you briefly though is that this looks a little warmer than the two bank because this has a 29 Kelvin lamp, 2900 Kelvin, which you can see has the red band on it so it's easy to identify. Then below this I've got the 3200 Kelvin tungsten. So the red is slightly warmer and designed that way to integrate with other lighting sources, which I'll talk to you a little more later when we go over lamps. These are then, of course, if you look further down, are all attached to our various ballasts that we use for each fixture. So now that we've gone over all the fixtures, we can see how these are being operated from a ballast. Now one thing important with fluorescent lamps, you must have a ballast to strike the lamp. We've got the single and double and four banks, and they're all controlled by these select ballasts down here. We have the single ballast. As you can see, it has select right on it. Then we have the double select ballast, which of course lights two lamps, and then the four bank select. As I said before, in order to change your output, you would then switch one lamp on or off at a time. And that allows you to change your output as well as your spread and continue the color balance that you started out with. All of our ballasts operate at 24 kilohertz. The reason for that is it's a very high frequency and it keeps out of the range of a normal 60 hertz pattern which creates flicker. And that's very critical when you're shooting film. The 24 kilohertz is, you know, by comparison, such a high frequency that not only does it allow us to have flicker-free operation at all film speeds, but also allows for absolutely dead quiet operation when you're shooting sound. The other significant thing about our ballast, which is very key, is their high output. A typical fluorescent four-foot tube is a 40-watt lamp. All our ballasts overdrive those lamps to 75 watts. Now typically that would drive any standard fluorescent lamp way into the green spectrum, but what we've done is corrected that so that you have a good high output balanced soft light from our fluorescent system. Normal household current being 60 hertz 
creates a problem for camera when you're shooting and you try to speed up your shutter, for instance, you will then notice a flicker. You actually will pick up the movement of the lamp, the oscillation. And this is where having our systems at 24 kilohertz plays such an important role because it allows it to be flicker free at all speeds. You'll never see that kind of flicker that you would off a typical 60 hertz household current. And it also is absolutely silent running. Okay. And here we have a four foot four bank that's rigged overhead on a Minimax stand. And you can see that it's using the baby receiver arm, in this case, instead of a 3 8 pin, so it can be mounted on a standard arm such as this that allows you to hang the fixture overhead. On some of our earlier ballast designs, the technology wasn't available for us to make instant on and off systems. So what would happen is if you would have a disconnect somewhere along the system, whether it be on the ballast or the lamp would go out or someone disconnected a lamp cable, not only would the ballast turn off, but then it would latch up for seven seconds. So if you reconnected, the ballast would appear like it was operating, but it wouldn't actually turn back on for seven seconds, which was making people think that the ballast was defective. Now, by, with current technology, we've been able to rectify that. Now, if there's a disconnect, what happens is it actually turns on and off instantly. There's no delay. However, the ballast is still electronically protected. What's happening is the ballast is still latching up, but with microtechnology, it, has, it happens in just a flash. So therefore, you don't realize that the ballast is actually restarting, but instantaneously. One of the advantages of the four bank select system is that instead of using a four bank fixture, I can actually split this off and use two double fixtures or four single fixtures. And there's a, a, a four bank to single splitter right here. So what I would do is shut off the balance first and I can disconnect the four bank cable and reconnect with a splitter. Now, instead of a four bank, I've got four single bank connections and I can either go direct to four single fixtures or I can put a up to 75 feet of cable between here and the fixture or I can go to even single harnesses. You can put up to 75 foot run on these ballasts to your fixture. So you can either run 75 feet of four bank cable and put a splitter on the end of it or you can put a splitter right on the ballast and run 75 feet of single cable in any direction and take a four bank and completely split it apart in four units. They interface this way. You would take a typical 25 foot cable and then plug them into each other and daisy chain them up to 75 feet. You can do this with a single, double, or four bank. This way you can either run them straight to the fixture or in case you're using a splitter, you can run the cables from the ballast and put the splitter on the end of your run. Here is a single harness basically just a cable with our connectors and one single plug. This then connects onto one end of your single splitter. Once that's connected, now I can illuminate one lamp at a time. This allows me to run up to four singles or two doubles off the same four bank ballast. All of our fixtures have a harness, whether it be single, double, or four bank. In this case, I have a single harness just for demonstration to show you how a harness will attach to each lamp. The clamp has a two-sided plunger that you push together and lift the connector off and then just easily to replace whichever lamp you want to do and put the harness back on. Our select ballasts run everything from 15 inch up to a four foot fixture. However, if you're going to go bigger than that with a six foot or an eight foot Kino flow, you'll need this ballast, the mega ballast. It will run either the six foot or the eight foot. You can tell by the cable it's very, very large, but this is a mega four bank. Works exactly the same as our select ballast. We have individual lamp selection, and it also has a switch. In this case, it's marked high output, standard output, because we're not putting anything shorter than a six foot lamp on here. Therefore, it can be calibrated to the same for both. And it will keep you within a color correct range at either level. So that's important to know if you have a standard output, you can kick it up to the higher output and get maximum output out of your fixture. This is the mega eight foot fixture. As you can see, it has the exact same design as our single, double, and four banks. Uh, but in this case, it's our you know, mega length fixture. We make them in six foot or eight foot, and they come in single, double, and four bank variations. This is the mount for our mega fixtures, meaning the six or eight foot. The big difference is it's a junior pin instead of a baby, so it has to be much heavier duty for the weight. And also, it's a much larger omni mount because of, the again, the size and trying to keep balance with the fixture that big. 
One thing I want to point out is this hollow opening is just for weight purposes. It is not a baby adapter. Sometimes people will get that confused. It's important to know this must be mounted on a junior clamp or a junior stand. The other thing is the way this tightens, this actually is a ratchet. It's similar to some of our product. Instead of just a regular twist butterfly, this is a ratchet arm, which you actually have to lift off, relocate, and lock in, and then turn. And then you would pull, turn, engage, and twist. And that's how you tighten or loosen this particular mount. This is the Flathead 80. It's an eight lamp Kinoflow fixture. There's a lot of significant difference to this is it has a aluminum housing as opposed to the polycarbonate housing that our other fixtures have had that I've been showing you. This also has a chrome grid on it. This grid is supposed to allow more light transmission versus the black louver. However, with more critical measurements, we've found that they're relatively the same, but they do have a mirror effect that spread the light in different ways and give you a little bit different spread. This fixture right now has 2,900 Kelvin tungsten lamps in it, and the camera is balanced for daylight. That's why it looks a little orange to you right now. Once I switch the camera, now you can see that it goes back to its normal white color because the camera's balanced to that level. So now I'll show you the other side of the flathead. You can see it has a carry handle built onto it to make it easy to move around set. It's got the heavy duty uh, junior mount, very similar, in fact, exactly the same as the Megas. And then it's run by the same select four bank ballast that we use for our typical four foot four bank. The significance here is that it's very lightweight and it's got a big powerful source that you can move around set and the ballasts aren't attached to the fixture so it's lightweight and easy to use. This is the blanket light, uh, pretty much our largest fixture we manufacture. Uh, it's designed for a very large soft source to just literally blanket a set with light, used a lot in commercials for, for instance, uh, cars, motorcycles, uh, or even in feature films when they're lighting maybe a big dining table where they want just nice soft coverage everywhere on set. And then of course you bring in your, your side play lights additional to that. Uh, this particular one has a light tools louver on it. And uh, once again, the louver is used to control the light, give a little more direction as opposed to just flooding the room completely. Uh, but you have that option to use it on or take it off if that's what you want to do. Um, it snaps together very easily. It comes in a kit with three cases so that you can literally put it together yourself in about maybe 30 minutes. The blanket itself is a very large harness uh, consistent with all the other lights that we make. It's a 16 lamp system and all the lamps are six feet. Uh, and because they're 16, that would take four four bank ballasts to operate. And because, again, they're six feet long, we use our mega ballast for these. Uh, therefore, you can, this gives you that individual lamp control again, no color shift, and you can bring in one up to 16 lamps. And then, of course, you can maybe skip a lamp here or there, go odd, even lamps, however you want to do it to create different light levels and, and create a very nice soft coverage. Uh, very easy to uh, put together. As I said, the, the blanket comes out of the case hangs over the frame which snaps together. Uh, then you put your diffusion or your reflector or your silk or your, your uh, louver and you know, ultimately finish off the fixture so it's completely uh, you know, giving the coverage that you're, you're, you're after. Uh, then of course you have four cables that interconnect down to the ballast which are in a separate box that hangs from one of the stands you would set up to, to mount this. Uh, or on the floor, if you will. The case holds four ballasts. You can use either standard mega ballasts or we now have the DMX mega ballast, which allows you that advantage of running it from a remote light board with DMX control. Here I'm gonna show you all of our lamps that we make exclusively for the Kino Flow line. Of course, they can be used in other systems, but the true match lamps, as you see here, are really the nucleus of the Kino Flow system. This is where it all started, is these balanced lamps that are designed by calculating the phosphorus from within the lamp without having to use a gel and presetting them for 2900 Kelvin, which is indicated by the red ring, as we've talked about, 3200 Kelvin, which has a gold, and daylight 55, which is blue. This is the basic T12 lamp that's used through our single double four bank from 15 inch up to the eight footers. One of the things we've incorporated in developing these lamps for use on production is the safety coating. And let me show you how we do that. This is a plastic shield and it's designed so that when you're on set, if you drop it and it shatters or explodes, the lamp shards will stay within this safety coating. And one of the most important things of that is the boot. It's, it's booted very, very tight because we found in 
previous designs that that boot can actually fly off or the end caps can actually fly off and explode. So we want to make sure it stays within this envelope so that everyone's safe and you can handle these you know, regularly without any uh, safety you know, concerns. The other thing, which is a side note of this safety sleeve, is it actually blocks harmful UV. So if you ever do a shoot in a museum where they have rare tapestries or print art or you know, any uh, fine art, fine painting, if you will, that is normally not allowed to have regular photography and flash photography, you can use these in those situations to give you an overview of all the lamps that we manufacture right now for our products. Uh, the, of course, the most widely used is our T12 lamp. That would go in our 15 inch up to eight foot lamps. Uh, and they're known as a T12. They're about an inch and a half in diameter, safety sleeved. The only time that these lamps are not safety sleeved is by request. If you have perhaps an image series that's going into a TV studio that's gonna stay permanently installed, you don't necessarily have to have the safety sleeve because the lamps aren't being taken in and out as frequently as you are in production. Uh, from there, we go to the more uh, second probably most common light is our compact lamp. And if you notice, all these are trademarked as true match. So you'll see our label on all of these. This is used in the Diva Light series. It's also used in the Paravim series. They're 55 watts, uh, and that's how they're uh, powered through those, those systems. And of course, they're dimmable. Uh, now these are not safety sleeved for the very same reason. They don't come in and out of the fixture very often. Uh, the standard T12s are the ones that are really being handled more frequently. Uh, and then from there we go to our, some of our smaller stuff. We've got the mini flow lamp, which is from our 9 or 12 inch fixture, which is our car kit. And then we have our very, very tiny micro flow lamps. And these are about the size of a pencil. Uh, the only difference is the length. We have 100 millimeter and 150 millimeter. And these come in a 3200 Kelvin or a 5500 Kelvin temperatures. We also have them in green and, and blue for chroma key. Um, the mini flow lamps come in 2900 and 5500 Kelvin temperatures, um, and so do the Diva lamps. I'm showing you these first because those are the more commonly used uh, lamps that are out there in our systems. The newer products that we're coming out with now would be the T8 lamp, and these are uh, really designed to go in a installation that's already existing. We make them in 3200 Kelvin or 5500 Kelvin, and you would just acquire these to put in existing fluorescent fixtures in a location. And they are not safety coded, um, and the only thing you have to worry about is that you won't have the high output that you would normally have through our ballast. You'll get whatever standard output that fixture is putting out, which is, uh, I believe, 30 watts on this type of lamp. And then lastly, uh, far second to last, is the uh, new Vista Beam lamp. This is a, this is a twin T7 tube. Uh, I believe it's only uh, seen in Europe other than here at KinoFlow. It's a 96 watt lamp, very, very bright, and that is in our new Vista Beam series, uh, which are also 29 and 5500. And then lastly is the Barfly quad tube, if you will, uh, designed exclusively for us. And as you can see, it's actually four four fingers, but only one base. It's actually one continuous tube. Uh, and these also come in 2,900 and 5,500 Kelvin. The reason we have a lot of these type of lamps in 2,900 versus the 32 is simply this. Because of feedback from the field, the 32 Ks were 3,200 Kelvin lamps were not warm enough. Uh, we found that to integrate with other systems that are in the field, perhaps airy or mole and what have you, that they're a lot warmer and they burn into maybe the 26 to 2800 Kelvin range. And they were saying the 32 Ks had to be gelled down too frequently. So we created the 2900 line to sort of answer the call of those so they can integrate on set better with, with existing instruments. The last two lamps are the Cameo ring lights, the six inch and nine inch. The six inch really is our current production model. However, the nine inch is a, a working prototype and is likely to be a future design for us to use in production. Uh, they also come in a 3200 Kelvin or a 5500 Kelvin. Now I'm going to show you the Image 80, probably one of the most commonly seen Kino flows on set besides the four bank, uh, used in film application for overhead lighting, green screen lighting, sometimes even on a stand in a pinch, and so if we don't have a flat head 80, they can use an Image 80 on a stand. It's also very common in television studios. Uh, most of the local networks use the Image 80s to create a nice soft coverage. But what I'm going to show you is how it works and give you a, an overview of that and the newest version, the Image 85. Here we've got an Image 80. It's an eight lamp, four foot fixture. It is an aluminum housing, so it only takes the four foot lamps. 
uh, but it will use the 29K, 32K, or 5500 uh, Kelvin lamps that our four banks normally take. Uh, it comes with a chrome louver. It's spring-loaded, so it's very easy to remove by just pulling down and then lifting the louver out. And as you can see, you have your eight lamps, usually safety-coated. However, you can use unsafety-coated lamps in a TV application if you know you're not going to be changing the lamps very frequently. The other small accessory here is the gel frame, which again, very easy, has two plungers, and that lifts off the front as well. And I'll show you briefly how to change the lamp. You just simply twist the lamp until the pins are in the slot and pull the lamp out. And then simply relocate the pins back into the tombstone. Just twist the lamp until you see the KinoFlow logo, or there is also a little three-point keyway and that's to tell you that should be straightforward and that gives you perfect orientation of the lamp to make sure you've got it inserted correctly. It is an eight lamp fixture as we've discussed and this is your manual control and it's numbered one through eight so as you turn the dial from one, two, three, four and so on the fixture will light from lamp one which is the center and then it will stay uniform two and then three and four and it will continue up to eight lamps from center out and then as you dial back down it will actually go from out to in so that you've always got a cluster of lamps together. That's how it works as a fixture. When you use the fixture in DMX mode, you have a different way to operate the system. First of all, you have your address, which is where you'll just use your analog counter to give the unit a number that will correspond with the board you're operating with. In other words, this is on channel 1001, therefore slider 1 will operate this unit. Once you've set the address, then you have to determine whether to run the instrument on fixture mode or individual lamp mode. This is where DMX plays a big role on how to control the image series. In fixture mode, it will operate just like we did manually. On channel 1, as your slider goes up, it'll go from channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and the whole fixture will light up. And as you dim down, it will then return from 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, down to that single lamp. But if you go to individual lamp mode, now I have converted this unit into an eight channel fixture. Now each lamp is controlled individually by a slider. So lamp one is channel one, lamp two is channel two, and so on. So you need to allow eight channels before you put your next image 80 in the system or in line in your DMX. So this would be one through eight now. And then your next one would be nine through 17 and so on. What we find easier is to just set your images at channel 1, channel 10, channel 20, channel 30, and allow yourself the room so if you do switch from fixture mode to individual lamp mode, after everything's rigged, you've already allowed the channels available, and you can just easily switch it on your board and move forward without having to go up and readdress the, the unit itself. From here, then you have your DMX in and out, which is just plug in and plug out. As we've talked before about DMX, you just daisy chain fixture to fixture. And next to that is your terminate switch. All of your units should ride at the open position unless it's the last unit in the line. And the very last unit is to be closed, which terminates the DMX line and gives the board some assimilation of how long that DMX run is and where it actually finishes. And then last, we have our power switch. Very simply, just on and off and always make sure it's on. Otherwise, when you get down to operate your DMX board, your fixture won't come on for you. And then next to your power switch is the main fuse. Very simply, you can just unscrew, put the fuse back in, should you have a fuse failure, and it twists back on. Briefly, I'm going to show you the newest version, the Image 85. It only has a couple of extra features, but they're very key to the operation of this unit and gives you much more control. First of all, it has a manual remote input now, so I can use the same manual remote that I've used on the Diva and Parabeam, so I can run this from the ground from 15 feet away without having a DMX controller. Secondly, there is now a high output standard output switch, which is now being controlled either manually or via channel 9 on DMX. So you want to remember the Image 85 is a 9 channel fixture versus the Image 80, which is 8. That ninth address gives you the high and standard output change. Therefore, you now have 16 lamp levels that are all color correct. When you're on set and you have a mixture of the Image 80 and Image 85, it's always best to just 
try to use the rule of using channel 1, 10, 20, and so on. Therefore, you've already allowed up to nine channels for each unit. You don't have to worry about if it's an 80 or an 85, as long as you have enough channels on your board to control that many. Now I'll show you the ParaZip 400. This is new for 2006. It's a variation on the ParaBeam. It's controlled exactly the same way. It has DMX addressing. You can switch from two to four lamps manually or through DMX. You have manual dimming and power. Everything on the back is the same. The key difference is how it mounts. This has a yoke mount versus the center mount on the ParaBeam. And it has a more linear design. Instead of having four lamps in parallel, now I've got two lamps in a linear layout and then two on top of the other. It's really good for tight ceilings or shorter ceiling height when you like to get this kind of output but you don't have enough room for the parabeam. And plus many gaffers and DPs, lighting designers have said we prefer the yoke mounting because that's something that's very similar to what you see on TV studio sets today. So we wanted to try and have an alternate mounting system for those people that require it. And lastly, the ParaZip has the same accessories available like the ParaBeam. You've got your gel frame, you have a louver you can put in. We have the 90, 60, and 45 degree black honeycomb louver. And of course, as usual, we have a sister unit, the ParaZip 200. So we always have a four bank and two bank to create that family of systems. We've taken the theory of the ParaBeam and gone to the next level and created the Vista Beam. This is new for 2007. It is equivalent to about a 6K soft light. You might say a, a either a 6K with a soft box or bounce light. That's the kind of output you're getting out of this. Now these lamps are 96 watts each, and believe it or not, it pulls a total of about 10 amps. So you can actually plug this into a standard wall outlet. It's pretty remarkable. And be warned, it is a very, very bright fluorescent fixture. It will give you the same kind of distance and throw that the parabeams do. As you can see, it has a very similar uh, parabolic mirror design, but these are twin T7 tubes, so they're about twice the size of the standard parabeam tube, so you're getting about double that output. It has a set of louvers as well, which is, again, 90, 60, and 45 degree to allow you some control, bring the light down to a focused area. It works like our select systems do, mainly because we want to avoid color shift. This is a six lamp fixture, and when you're running it manually, it starts with light one in the center, and then starts uniformly two, three, four, five, and six. And then as you reverse that order, it will do the same, keeping all the lamps together in a uniform fashion, and allowing you to have six lamp levels without a color shift. But there's an additional control on this fixture, as we have on the new Image 85, which is a high output, standard output. So now you have 12 color correct lamp levels. And as the Image 85 series, you can also individually address each lamp. So I can run this as a fixture, like so, or I can control each lamp individually and create a pattern. And one of the great benefits is you can run daylight or tungsten. So you could have perhaps a mix of the two light sources, or have daylight and tungsten standing by so you can switch from daylight for a scene and then go to the other tubes and switch to tungsten without ever having to address the fixture and change the lamps out. Let me show you the varying ways you can mount the Vista Beam, which makes it really film friendly when you're on set trying to find a way to rig a fixture of this size. It's roughly three by three and it weighs about 45 pounds. It's not real heavy, pretty easy to handle, but when you're trying to rig it overhead, there's some challenges that can be you know, address this way. First of all, there's a center mount. Uh, it's very strong. It has a pivot to it, so you can loosen this arm and actually go up or down with a pivot this way. You have one axis. The other thing is there is a locking arm here that you can open up, and this gives you the ability to pivot the fixture either horizontal or vertical very smoothly, and then lock that into posi any position that you wish. The other way you could adjust it would either be on the stand itself, you could actually adjust the, the tube mount itself, or just spin it around on the stand. So you have lots of ways to orient the fixture from a center mount standpoint. The other ways to mount it are, there's a yoke mount you can request, and it can be yoke mounted either direction. So you can set it to whatever axis you want, and it'll stay in that fixed position. We also have carry handles, one on either side, to make it easy for one person to put it on a stand or rig. 
The other way to rig this fixture is using the corners. They have multiple purposes. One is the fixture can actually be stacked one on top of the other so that you can roll them around set and rig each one as you move around on a flat cart. But each one has a opening or a ring which allows you to do a four-way tie off and with a center tie be able to hoist the fixture from a rope tie which is very commonly seen with chicken coops and you can then adjust your level just by adjusting your ropes overhead. The back panel of the Vista Beam, very familiar sight. Manual control from zero all the way through six. In this case, you can select all the way down to complete zero light. Or you can plug in the hardwire manual dimmer control so you can control from the ground. And lastly, you have your DMX in and out, which allows you to control all of this from your DMX board. It has your typical standard and high output. It also has individual lamp and fixture mode, which once again, to remind you, allows you to address it as one complete fixture or address each lamp individually. And channel seven in this case will be your high standard output switch. And as well for the Vista Beam, we have the same like product that will allow you to control the unit, which is either a gel frame to add some diffusion or you have the 90, 60, and 45 degree black honeycomb louvers available for it. Additional to the Vista Beam 600, we also have the other matched unit for this family is the Vista Beam 300. It can also be center mounted or yoke mounted and has the same accessories and DMX controls as the Vista Beam 600. This is the Calora system. It's the only LED system that we've produced. Uh, it will control any RGB or red, green, blue DMX LED source. Uh, this particular one though will run up to four fixtures uh, and then you can of course daisy chain DMX from this to subsequent units as many as you want. Each lamp has an individual channel so you can run them individually or you can run them as unique together and have them all on the same channel and they'll all respond equally. We have a single channel controller that we designed strictly for those that don't have a sophisticated DMX board. They can either dial into a specific color and it's not as detailed of increments as you would on a DMX board but it gives you some variation. You can go from red to green to blue or if you push the button there's different scroll patterns or modalities and there's even a flash mode. Uh, the Caloris here is a 24 volt 150 watt system. It basically just runs off standard AC. Just plug it in and you've got your power uh, and then you'll install each lamp separately and then have your addresses put in and you're off, to, off and running. One thing that's very important about the Caloris is that it is red, green and blue, very spiked colors and it's not intended to be used as a white light. There are white LEDs out there but this is not one you would want to use for that. Once you put all those color factors together you're going to get a very, very magenta, uh, very um, pasty type of look and uh, it's very important, it's designed not to be used as a white light, but as a color background for music video, bar scene, uh, any type of, uh, you know, maybe you can use it for flashing of a, uh, police lights, things like that. But strictly color background, not, definitely not to be used as a white light. This is the Cameo, K-A-M-I-O, just to make sure you get the spelling right. Probably one of our most unique products because it's an onboard light for, for the most part. It's designed to actually go on to your lens. This is a 112 millimeter opening, a Panavision Primo. From there, you step down to various sizes. What you need to find out is the outside diameter of your lens, not the focal length, but the actual physical size, and match that to your step down ring. Slip that into the back of the Cameo, it goes right onto your lens. It's a clip on map box system. It works very similar to any other clip on map box. Now, what you're seeing here is the Cameo 6E, and the E means ENG. Is strictly the light system itself. The other version of the Cameo is just simply the Cameo 6 and I'll show you how to put a lamp in it but in the meantime you'll notice it has actually two 4x5 filter trays and this is more for the production side. Uh, still a clip-on system works with the same step-down rings designed really identically but having those two filter trays actu will actually help the DP keep the continuity if he wants to put an ND filter or a perhaps a pro mist, something like that, that they've been using throughout the production already. Then you take your six inch ring lamp, there's three clips, and you just line up the hole with the plug, you snap it in, and you're ready to go. Just plug in the lamp from behind, put your step down ring on, put it on your lens, and you're all set. Now there's other features of the Cameo I'd like to show you as well. 
there are barn doors available. And again, these are accessories that work for both the Cameo 6 and the 6E. So you have a long top barn door that locks on, and then you have two side barn doors as well that you can add, which will create like a mat box extension. That way you can avoid any you know, light coming in from around the, the back of the Cameo. Also, if you notice, it's a very deep baffle inside, and the idea is so that you don't have any light leak that will curve back into your lens and create any kind of lens flare. So that's also part of the design. Now the ballast is a 12 volt system. So the ballast is uh, designed to go on your camera, it actually mount right on top of your camera. Um, and it is a dimmable system. So you've got that ability to control your output a little bit. And even though fluorescence dim a little bit, in this case being a face light, that magenta can actually help you know, really warm the face instead of using maybe a cosmetic rose or type filter to, to bring out the flush of, of a face, this can actually be a, a nice little conduit of adding some magenta to the face. Um, on off switch directly on the unit. Uh, we have uh, power on one end, which is a unique plug. You can only plug it into that one place. And then you've got the lamp on the other side, clearly indicated so it's easy to get everything wired up. Now this is running into a power supply which is uh, AC, and the 12 volt system is a standard four pin XLR, so I can either go to a battery block or a battery belt, or plug that into my AC power supply, and I can use this power supply anywhere in the world. It will auto automatically detect from 100 to 250 volts, so I can use it anywhere in the world. And the complete kit actually comes with a 230 volt cable to give you some uh, ease of connection when you're going in different countries. Um, the lamps are 3200 or daylight 5500. We also have gel frames and uh, gel template that comes with our kits. This template is designed to cut out your gel. Once you have that done, you can attach it to one of these plastic clears. And the idea is just to give some rigidity to your gel. Then you can slip it over the front of the unit and you've got yourself a nice you know, gel lamp in front if you need to either correct or perhaps put an unusual color on the lamp. The other uh, accessory I'll show you is the flex arm mount. And this is designed for those that don't necessarily have the right ring size with them, or they just might want to use it for maybe tabletop or perhaps uh, mount it on a wall on a, on a C stand. I mean, you can really put this just about anywhere. It matches the 112 millimeter of the unit itself, it slips right into the back of the cameo. And then this flex arm mount can be then manipulated into a position and locked into place. So it will literally stay right where you put it and you can roll your camera into it or you can perhaps bring it down to shoot some miniature or any type of close up work, which is very nice. Then you've got that dimmability. So it's a great feature for uh, working close proximity. One thing to remember about the Cameo, though, it's a soft fill light. It's designed for about four feet from your talent. That should give you just enough to give you a nice full fill and instead of having an OB light where you've got to bounce or use additional lighting to try and create a nice look all the way around the face, the Cameo is designed to uh, work right around the lens so you're right in that same axis as the lens is shooting and you get a perfect soft light all the way around. This is one of the Kino Flow bonus accessories. One of the great things about the Cameo is that being DC, you want to be able to walk around untethered. This is an Anton Bauer power tap cable. So you can plug this into the ballast, plug it onto your power tap battery, and then you could actually walk around untethered with the Cameo on your lens and your ballast mounted on top of the camera and give you a flexibility of movement. This is the mini flow system. It is also known by many as the car kit because you can run it off your 12 volt cigarette lighter in your car. And also because of its small size and ease of use in an environment like that, it's used in many other types of applications. It's been used to backlight cockpit lights in aircraft scenarios or, or those types of uh, very integrated, you know, small light source. Uh, but mainly it is a 12 volt, nine inch or 12 inch lamp. It's a T5 lamp, so it's kind of small. We have a single ballast like this, which has the dimmer built on, or we have the newer double ballast. The big difference is with the single ballast, you have to use this power supply. You run from the ballast to the power supply and then to your AC. If you're going 12 volt, you just go straight to your 12 volt battery source. The double mini flow actually has the power supplies built in. So all you have to do is directly 
put your lamps in, you've got individual lamp control, you've got individual dimming control, and then it's got direct AC or DC input. You don't have to couple the power supply to it. So that makes it a little bit simpler from a rigging standpoint, but many people still use the single ballast because they like to be able to use them in two different locations. But there are extensions and so forth which allow you to really spread these pretty far apart anyway. This is the 9-inch mini flow. As you can see, it's got a typical reflector and louver, but it's all Velcroed together. So I can pull the lamp out, like so. I can take the reflector off and then put the lamp back in and use it just as a nice big soft source in a car. I can put it under a visor, on the side of the door, under the steering wheel, anywhere I want to illuminate the inside of the car or, you know, illuminate your, your talent's face. Uh, what the reflector does, of course, is just give you a direction. By putting this back in, it'll actually give you a, a ability to sort of control the light a little bit more and selectively put it on whatever you're trying to light. Like everything else, a reflector and louver system is pretty standard with most of the KinoFlow products. Also, there's some very small side mounts here, and that is designed to take some flex tubing. And if you really want to get creative, Hi, my name is Frieder Hoheim. 20 years ago, working as a gaffer in Hollywood, lights didn't exist that I needed to work with, so I designed them. Join me today as we look at the world of KinoFlow. Hi, I'm Tom Jacob, sales rep for KinoFlow Incorporated. I'm here to show you some great stuff about our product line today. Let's go have a look. Uh, the first thing I'd like to show you is the 4 foot 4 bank. This is probably our most widely used fixture worldwide and it starts with something that you want to be aware of and that is select lighting. In, uh, in other words, these fixtures operate with individual lamp selection to be able to adjust your output. Uh, it originally started as a expendable. It was uh, made out of paper, if you can believe that, and it was designed to be able to hammer or tape, if you will, onto a wall or anywhere on a set that was uh, unable to really fit a soft light in. Uh, and then uh, you would throw away the fixture and reuse the lamps and harnesses later. Uh, it eventually evolved into cardboard, different types of plastics, and eventually into this uh, polycarbonate fixture we have today, which has uh, a lot of durability and longevity. And uh, it's come from people like yourselves in the industry that have given us the kind of feedback that we needed to make it a better product. If you lower the temperature of a lamp by dimming it down, it can become warmer because the green content will then dissipate and become more magenta. If, and adversely, if you overheat the lamp, if, which I will show you later, is that um, it will start to go green. Your green will actually increase, which is something we're constantly dealing with, not just with fluorescent sources, but all lighting sources. We're using minus greens and plus greens to try to balance that color correction. <clears throat> what makes Kino Flow so unique is that we have found a way to balance the lamp without gelling it, without plus or minus green. It actually is um, balanced from the tube within by calculating the phosphors for different color temperatures. Therefore, when you, you know, turn on the light, it actually is um, already there at that temperature. So you know what you're getting, tungsten or daylight. And um, it takes a usually maybe one to two minutes to warm up to its optimum temperature. But for the most part, once you're you know, live on stage and you've got everything up and it's warmed up, you will hit that balanced color temperature, which is critical in filming today. One of the great things about the four foot four bank is it makes your work look sensational. It is, the whole KinoFlow line is really designed to make your life easier, make your work faster uh, and more accurate and take some of the guesswork out of it. Many people that really don't have a lot of background in lighting and film um, don't necessarily know how to correct a lamp or how to uh, you know, light for a certain look. And what I try to do is let them know that, first of all, the KinoFlow is one of many tools. Uh, it's a great tool, mind you, but it's not the universal tool. You really need to know what you're trying to capture when you, you know, decide how you're going to light a particular set. But the KinoFlow has, line has augmented to a level where you can do pretty much anything now. Um, one thing I can tell you about the four foot four bank, and here's a, a, a story you can remember, is uh, one of the great DPs of our industry, Russell Carpenter. Uh, who is the Oscar winner for Titanic, came in here a few weeks ago telling us that he was um, starting to do a lot of, you know, stills, perhaps, uh, still life, you know, fruit, flowers, things like that. And um, 
he was being complimented on his work so much that he was, uh, you know, finally asked, how do you light this? What are you doing? He goes, I put a four bag here, I put a four bag here, and then I roll. So uh, there's a perfect example of what we can do for you. Um, but again, you need to know a little bit more about the product, and that's what I'm here to tell you, is to kind of go through the detail of what you would work with, whether it's a select lighting, a dimmable product, or perhaps into our TV production lighting, which is a lot more powerful and, and bright. Uh, it is very easy to um, describe. It is a four foot, four bank. You know, we make a series of sizes. Uh, we make from 15 inch all the way up to eight foot. That'd be 15 inch, two foot, three foot, four foot, six foot, and eight foot. And we make single, double, and four bank. And they're identified just by their size and how many tubes they are. A two foot double is a two foot long, two lamp fixture. A four foot four bank is a four foot long, four bank fixture, and so on. So it's easy to identify, easy to translate from one person to another, we hope. We try to make our terminology simple so that it makes it easier for you to find the right thing you're looking for. What I'm going to show you is a four foot four bank because the system is standard through the single, double, and four bank and through all the sizes. So this design will, just by one, will tell you how all of our select lighting works in, in a nutshell. So um, we've got four lamps here and at this point I've got um, a, uh, there's some components that, that create the total of a fixture and that would be the uh, fixture housing, the reflector, the lamp, and then finally the louver which is on the outside and that's used to control the light. 